Okay, so once again, I just apologize for the last minute having to cancel the online um, meeting for class because um, my computer was stuck in an update loop that would not um, that ended up not ending until sometime this morning. So um, again, I apologize, but I'm going to go through and have this recording so you guys can kind of go through and still have something available that shows you know for for class. So. One of the things is if you logged in last night, you would have noticed that there was a video and an assignment that looked very similar to what we had last week. And that's what um, that's because it was somehow I managed to duplicate that assignment. Um, and since you guys worked on and did that last week, I've already deleted that and we're just not going to have an assignment this week. So um, this week, um, you've got the lesson notes, you've got a quiz, and then you've got the discussion. And one of the topics that we'll be discussing during the lesson from chapter six is the concept of intrinsic versus extrinsic knowledge. So the discussion is kind of um, regarding centered around that. So with that, I'm going to move into the notes and start talking about the chapter. Let me just adjust some things. So this chapter, um, we're talking more so, um, we, last week we started talking about building the story and how the story within gaming, um, as you go through and you look at the story elements, there's a lot of similarities between the story elements that go into building movies and, and things like that. But there's a lot of differences because of having to keep the player engaged and the player involvement and um, players don't always take the same direct path that that a a movie or some or a story with so this week we're going to talk, go, start talking and we're going to start exploring the concept of gameplay and we're going to move into um basically creating the experience is the subtopic so the key topics in this chapter were um and the key questions are what are the game what are games challenges and strategies associated with gameplay what are inter interactivity modes and how do they relate to gameplay what is the relationship between gameplay and story, which is a key factor? Um, what are the difference between static and dynamic balance? And then we're going to talk about a concept of two concepts called the prisoner's dilemma and the tragedy of the common, commons in, and how they apply to cooperative gameplay. So when you sit there and you first, one of the first things you have to decide when you're working with your gameplay is you have to work on and figure out um your your rules of play um and obviously when going through and figuring out rules of play one of the first things you want to figure out is your victory conditions so you know every game pretty much has some sort of victory condition at some sort of condition where the game ends essentially um and when you're sitting there and you're looking um, kind of some games, it's it's very clear, like if it's a puzzle game, you solve the puzzle. Um, if it's a sports game, you know, sports games, um, victory condition is you win, win the game um, you're playing. Um, some games, the victory condition is maybe not so not so clear, but most games are going to have um, some point of victory condition where someone can say they won and someone can say they lost. And obviously, if we have to go through and setting up the rules that define what winning is or what victory is, we are also going to have in our rules of play what consider, what's considered a loss condition. Um, and again, some games, it can be very clear what the loss condition is. And some play games, it could be, you know, some games, it could be not so much. Um, one of the concepts the the book talks about is the concept of where you're sitting there and you're looking um is where it talks about like if you're playing a game where where your character specifically runs out of um runs out of lives um or you know just typically dies or runs out of resources or something something like that this is kind of defined these are things that are defined as an explicit loss con condition um as opposed to maybe an implicit loss to see, you know, um, condition where just maybe um, there's, there's different different ways. Um, 
losses are defined. So after you sit there and you kind of go through and you define your rules of play in your gameplay, we're going to move into um, interactive uh, interactivity modes. So obviously when you talk about interactivity, um, you know, this is not a new, you know, we've been talking about it. We've been going through um, in the storytelling. We kind of talked about this a little bit, even in the building up of the game, um, the backbone of the games and, and, and how games are played as well. Um, but now we're kind of getting into more so not interactivity of the system, but interactivity of the specific game. The first interactivity you're going to have is your player to game interactivity. And this interactivity is classified by um, where basically you're sitting there and it's a, this is kind of your single, single player mode and you're either going to sit there and you're going to be interacting and playing against um, non-player ca characters. So these characters um, are essentially controlled by computer and AI. Um, obviously, as you sit here and you see the example of a fighting game like Tekken where where it's it, this could be a, a single person interactive game or it can you know this this could come back as in the player play um the next interactivity mode which is um player to player so player to player modes is um interactivity is the players are still interacting with the game and they're still interacting with the non-player characters but they're also interacting with with um where there's an interactivity and connection between other players and they can communicate sometimes can communicate with each other. So, um, this kind of brings up, you know, we'll, we'll kind of go into this a little bit more with the player to player, um, interactivity, but just to say that right now for the interactivity mode, it, player to player interactivity is where you have one player interacting with an interacting with another within the game, and it could be either cooperative or competitive. Um, like I said, we'll kind of go into this a little bit more as we start talking more about about that. Um, the next mode is a very interesting interact interactivity mode because it kind of takes place outside of the game, and this is called player to developer, and a lot of this is where essentially players can go in and um, through the idea of using forums, through the ideas of, you know, just through different online um, communication tools, they can act, interact with the de actual developers of the games and maybe get, maybe get tips um, on how to play the game, tips on secrets, or maybe even um, provide input into um, future features available in, in the game. And, you know, it, it's kind of, it's just a further adding to, to the depth of the game. Um, there's a lot of games that have, you know, interactivity like this. There's some that don't have any, um, but this is just kind of another way to, to broaden the reach of interactivity um, regarding the game. So the last um, interactivity mode that we're going to talk about is the player to platform. So this is an interactivity mode that kind of creates a connection, um, not so much create, creating connection between the creating a connection between the player. It creates a connection between the player and the game, but it also creates a connection between the player and the platform they're playing on. So when you're sitting here and you're looking the um, the example example here, they sit there they're showing the Wii. So the player to platform connection would be the connection with the Wii remotes as you're moving around the player to platform connection. Um, it's going to be interactive. It, it, you know, it's basically your interactivity based on your systems, great graphics and um, graphic and sound capabilities, the um, input input devices that are available, um, what kind of memory barriers, battery storage. Um, your player to platform interactivity is all about the, the power or lack of power depending on the type of hardware, um, just how much the hardware allows you to connect. So um, obviously one of the, the things that made the Wii so popular um, back when it came out was, was this player to platform interactivity, the Wii remotes, the, the, the motion, the ability to move and everything to where you weren't just sitting there um, pushing buttons on a controller. You, you, you actually became part of the controller. Um, 
if you've ever had if you've had the opportunity to play um play with any of the new vr tools like the like the oculus the oculus takes this this um takes this concept and makes it even even further to where where when you have the oculus goggles on you are fully immersed in the world and and because you have the remotes in your hand you can actually see your hands and you know see your motions and be able to do other things within the system so now that we're done with talking with um talking about interactivity mode we're going to move on to the concepts in game theory so when you sit there and you talk about game theory you you got to under first understand kind of what it is and game theory is just the focus on the types of conflicts that exist in existing, existing games and how players might respond to these conflicts so obviously when you're sitting there you're looking and you're thinking about um game theory it it typically is going to um apply to games that contain two or more opponents um now it does not necess necessarily mean that all of the opponents are um, players, they could be non-player, non-player characters. It could still be one person versus one person versus, you know, a player, player versus the system type thing. But, you know, you're going to have game theory is going to apply where, where there's two or more opponent opponents introducing this conflict. So the first concept in, um, game theory is, um, called zero, zero sum and zero sum basically involves it's where your players um basically where you're sitting here and you're looking and you are completely competing against each other um they're they have completely opposing interests um the classic example of a zero-sum game is where you sit there and you look at, classic example is chess um the goal of chess is to eliminate the other person there is no co-op there is there is zero um zero cooperation whatsoever you're you're you you know um it's a game where it's impossible for for both per, both players to get what they want there is going to be a clear definitive winner a clear definitive loser when you get through there you know and when you sit there and you um the concept of, with zero sum games zero sum games only involve competitive balance there is no other other concepts with it um now, when you sit there and you look, um, ob obviously, if we have zero, th zero sum, we have non zero sum. Um, and non zero sum involves where is games where it involves um, basically if zero sum is players have have completely opposing interest, non zero sum is where players do not have completely opposing interest. These type of games are, um, you know, when you sit there and you're massive multiplayer online games where you're completing where we're basically um all the players in the game are are kind of competing together against a against um non-player non-player characters <clears throat> or um these are a lot of the games where you may be competing against each other but you're competing against each other in um in you know the idea of comp comp um cooperation um for example like the guitar hero games um you know a lot of times with the guitar hero games you had multiple people playing together to make to get to get the best total score but there was also you know individual scores and such like that um you know sometime um sometimes you run into a situation in in his non-zero sum game where you're sitting there and you're looking and you could have players within that game that are considered or classified within the game as enemies but they have to cooperate to reach reach some sort of some sort of goal along the way to um building it um and this is, these are just ways to you know where you're sitting there and you're looking and um you know you look where where if you're building a game that is a um business simulation type game and you have you know you'll have competing businesses cooperate in certain ways to achieve goals um to be able to sit there and to work towards you know work towards maybe some bigger goals or some smaller goals or you know where the cooperating where the businesses will cooperate with each other to draw in more people into their area um, for example a shopping mall shopping mall normally doesn't have 
just one of one of one type of store. They have multiple stores of the same type that will do things that that their goal is to get more people into the shopping mall because that means if you get more people into the mall, you get more people possibility of more people into your store. So um, it kind of makes it a good thing for for competitors to cooperate in certain aspects with that. So now as we kind of go in and we're going to we're going to focus a little bit on, here on this concept with non-zero zero non-zero non sum the concept is called the prisoner's dilemma. And in the prisoner's dilemma um basically you it, it involves two it's kind of two people and you, players are you're basically working where you're you're competing with each other in a non-zero sum but you're also having to kind of cooperate and the pr prisoner's dilemma involves two people. Um, it essentially, it would be you and your partner. And you and your partner are involved in some sort of crime, and you're in arrested. So in this case, we're sitting there and we're saying you're arrested in sus suspicion of, of theft. Um, but here's the thing is you're arrested on the suspicion of theft, but the authorities have no proof. So basically, the only way that they're going to be able to... Um, get you on anything is if one of you talks or both of you talk um but and so in doing this they're going to separate separate you from separate you so you have no way of talking or communicating with your your partner so when you're sitting there in the prisoner's dilemma kind of looking at this grid here um one of the things is when you look, um, basically the the concepts we're sitting here we're looking at is you're looking at what this grid is. If if you both keep keep quiet and don't say anything, you're looking at one year in jail for for the crime you've committed. Um, you, if you decide that you're going to squeal on your partner, your par you will end up because you were the good guy and you said, nah, he did it all. I didn't, I didn't, you know, you know, just confess that he did it all. You don't even have to say anything about your involvement. Just confess that your other per person did it. If you squeal, but they decide that they're not going to say anything. Well, then because you told them they did everything, they're going to get five years and you're going to get zero years. Um, and then the, the other scenario is if they decide that they're going to talk, obviously, and you keep quiet you're going to end up getting five years. Um, and then the other, um, when you sit there and you look, if you end up both squealing, you're also going to both end up getting three years. So when you're sitting there and you're looking here, um, one of the things is, is um, some of the, some of the things when you're looking at, okay, what's the reward? So in this case, you're both rewarded for cooperating with each other. Um, uh, basically neither one of you, neither one of you talking. Um, And in some of this situation, you would sit there and you'd say, okay, well, yeah, the reward is for both of us keeping quiet, we still get one year in jail. If I squeal and they don't, the other person doesn't squeal, I get zero years, but there's still probably some sort of punishment. Um, so, and th think again, the punishment, you know, basically, um, obviously, if you both squeal on each other, you're both going to get punished and, um, but you're not in jail for five years and you only you know in sitting there and talking about with the way the game game works um first one first scenario scenario where you both keep quiet and cooperate yeah you get one year in jail but you get three points in the game second scenario is um you know where you both you know both squeal um well you, you don't get the five years you could have gotten but you only get one point in the game so the con the reason that with the prisoner's dilemma the reason that there's reason that this kind of adds into the non-zero game non-zero sum game theory is it adds in the concept of the temptation is you have this temptation to squeal because with the temptation to squeal you get zero years in prison um however with that temptation um if you do decide to yield to the temptation you're also running the risk of your partner of your partner doing the same, which means that you could end up with the worst, you know, end up in a, in a worst case scenario. And it, it kind of opens up a lot of, um, opens up a lot of 
different opens up a bigger dilemma because um maybe maybe with with penalties and um punishment like this maybe it's not so much of a not so much of a um dilemma you know okay it's if it's worth it's worth it's worth even worth the possibility i'll keep quiet it's worth e even if there's the possibility that i'm going to get five years because the other person talked because five years isn't that bad in 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 game world or you know it, it opens up a lot of a dilemma but you know when you sit there and you look at it um obviously when you're sitting there and you're looking at this prisoner's dilemma one of the things is that the scenario kind of illustrates just one turn in a game um, that could have many possible turns. So when you're sitting there and you're going through this whole situation and you add in the non-zero sum prisoner's dilemma, you could have multiple situations throughout the game where you have this type of concept of decision making having to be made. It may not be this particular concept, but it's going to be where... Um, Again, you have you know two players that are partners essentially, but they're they're and they have to cooperate, but they're also playing against each other. So it's it's working for where you're sitting there and you're working into the strategy of the game. You're working into um, overall the overall gameplay. This affects the overall gameplay because this this con concept of the this constant dilemma that you're playing as you're cooperating with the other with the other player in the game. Um, your goal is to def your goal is to be able to get through all the scenarios, but your goal is also to defeat them. So at some point, you're going to have to, to choose um, choose situations that don't make for everybody. You know where you both get the equal points and stuff like that. So the next um, next non zero thumb some concept is called the tragedy of the commons and when you're sitting there and you're looking at it is um kind of the two concepts with the tragedy of the commons is where you sit there and you're looking and um you know the you know first example is if you're sitting there and you have a ship where you have 10 people who are rowing and one person decides to break take a break well if all 10 take the break take the break at the same time um, and stop rowing, the ship's going to stop moving. Whereas if you take alternate turns on stopping, the ship will continue continue moving. Um, a better understanding of the concept is when you sit there and you look and you're driving along the interstate, driving along the highway, and you come across the accident and everybody stops and slows down to look at the accident. And it just can, can, as this continues to happen, it continues to slow traffic down and make things back up even more and more and more and more and more. So when we're sitting there and we're talking of the tragedy of the co commons is exactly that. It's, um, it's kind of a social trap where the rationale, the, you know, the rational decision based on resources leads to an ir ir it, it, the, the definition of the tragedy of concept commons is it's a social trap, which a rational decision based on resources leads to an irrational dis result. So again, if we're sitting there and we're looking and um, my resources is energy and I'm rowing a boat and I'm running low on ener energy. Well, my rational decision would be to stop rowing for a little bit to replenish my energy resource. Well, Again, if everybody decides to stop rowing to replenish their energy um, resource at the same time, everyone stops rowing and the boat stops moving. Um, you know, the rational decision driving past an accident may be to, oh, wait a minute, I know so-and-so and they drive along this route all the time. Let me look to make sure that that's not them in this accident. If everybody, you know, when you do that, it's rational, it's it's everything makes sense with it until you sit there and you start seeing everybody kind of going through and making that same decision. And you sit there and you get complete unintended, you know, unintended consequences or the, or a result that does not match your rational decision-making. So I hope that makes sense with it. So 
now as we've kind of gone through and kind of beat up on the the concepts of the 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 concepts of dilemmas and stuff like that we're going to move into the concepts of challenge so when you sit there and you look um gameplay is often going to be involved with um a series of challenges so um and you know obviously the game the challenges you're going to face are going to be based off of based off of the type of and genre of the game you're going to play so the first concept we're going to look into is the um concept of implicit versus explicit challenge so an explicit explicit challenge is um intentional immediate and often often intense um so in for example if you're in in, in, in an action game um the explicit challenge may be um you know having the exact timing to jump over jump over a, something you know for example in Don, Don, donkey kong the explicit challenge in donkey kong is as the barrels coming towards you um knowing exactly when to jump to be able to clear the barrel so it doesn't hit and take away one of your lives um so ex in this example it's got two two graphics from different games um and Obviously, when you sit there and you look at the graphic on the left is, is the example of the explicit challenge. And the reason this is an explicit challenge is you're driving and you sit there and you see the explicit challenge of trying to, to navigate this area without crashing and possibly, you know, pass more cars as well. The implicit challenge is, um, it's, it's something that's, um, kind of an emergent feature of of the game it, it's it's not something that not something that is immediately right there it's not intention everything but your implicit challenges within a game um still invite um you know still involve there are still challenge there's still challenge associated with it um so the challenge in this case um the challenges associated with it is when you're sitting you're looking at the same game need for speed um, you have your explicit challenges of driving, but your implicit challenges are the the upgrades to the car you choose, um, what kind of resources you have and how you allocate them. So a lot of time, and again, that's that's the same thing is if you're sitting you're playing a strategy game like risk, um, your your implicit challenge is where you where you deploy all your you know where you deploy your troops and and your all your units to be able to sit there and accomplish accomplish your your major goal. So um, the next concept in the challenge is perfect versus imperfect knowledge. So when you're sitting here looking um, perfect, you know, perfect knowledge basically has to do where um, as you're going through and you're playing the game and you're working through your challenge, your perfect, perfect um, information means that you have all the information you need in front of you to be able to make your decision, make, make your decisions and, um, you know, and go through and understand it. So um, in the example here, they show um, backgammon. When you look at a game like backgammon, a game like chess, a game like checkers, all of those games, they, they contain perfect knowledge within the challenge because you have, you know, the complete entire state of play by looking at your game board. And from that, from that knowledge, you can go through and face your challenges and decide how you're going to overcome, overcome them. Um, with imperfect information or imperfect knowledge, you're only provided with a fraction of the information um, needed to make the, make the best, best decision. And even in games like poker, um, you're provided with very little information um, about what your opponent has. The only information you're provided with is what you have in your hand. And based off the inform based off what you have in your hand, um, you have to sit there and go through and make make this make decisions and um, kind of go through and and choose make your choices within the game. Um, you know, in the intention of trying to win it. So obviously, having imperfect knowledge adds a little increases the challenge of the game sometimes. So when you're sitting there and you're talking um, the concept of intrinsic versus extrinsic 
um, knowledge. So intrinsic knowledge is knowledge basically that, um, again, it's part of the challenge. It's intrinsic knowledge is knowledge that you gain, gain from within in the game world. So as you're going through, um, for example, um, so as you're going through the game, um, gaining knowledge about how how a magic spell works, gaining knowledge about how to how to pass a how to pass through a certain type of door, gaining you know any kind of knowledge, basically any kind of knowledge that you gain while playing the actual game, is what would be considered intrinsic knowledge. Extrinsic. Uh, Extrinsic knowledge is knowledge that's gained outside the game world, but applies to the game. So, for example, um, when you sit there and you look at it, um, extrinsic knowledge can add um, an element of reality to the game. So, knowledge such as wood floats, ice melts, paper burns, you know, different things like that. Um, those are things that are knowledge you have outside the game, but as you go through and you're playing the game, you can use that knowledge. Um, for example, you have to cross a river. You've got a large piece of wood in front of you that you're able to manip manipulate to get into the river. Well, you can use that large piece of wood to float across, float down, because you have the extrinsic knowledge um, that wood floats. Um, and that's the concept. Those that's the concept of extra, intrinsic versus extrinsic knowledge. So one of the other um, challenges out there is um, spatial awareness. So sometimes when you're playing games, when you're playing a game, um, you're navigate you're navigating through you know possibly difficult environments, and the challenge becomes kind of it's kind of a challenge where you're talking challenge that kind of applies to puzzles or vehicle sims but being aware of the space around you to be able to sit there and maneuver and make the right right you know right decisions um and again a lot of this challenge falls into games where you know kind of like like the example they have here games where you have to move around a sp around a space in in a specific pattern or a specific way to be able to um you know make it May, you know, to be able to achieve the goal. So um, one of the, the next challenge is kind of pattern recognition and matching. And there's tons of mobile games that are very based off this is basically where you're sitting there and you're looking at some sort of pattern, um, whether it be color, whether it be shape, whether it be color and shape, um, games like Tetris, game, you know, games like any of the anything related to the Candy Crush type stuff. Um, it involves all, you know, pattern recognition and matching to be able to sit there to clear your boards and to be able to ultimately um, reach your goals. Um, some of the games have challenges like resource management, where you're where you're managing your game, your entire gameplay is about managing managing the resources you have. Um, you know, the example it gives is um, FIFA Football Manager. Um, in FIFA Football Manager, you're not necessarily playing the soccer games but you are managing the team and going through and making the decisions how the 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 players are going to the the not you know the players within the game are going to play your game um you choose what players you have what strategy you're going to use and and then ultimately the game simulates based off your decisions um and your management of the resources um So one of the challenge, one of the simple challenges that's out there um, that's used a lot in action type games is reaction time. So the challenge is specifically how quickly you can react to something that happens on the screen. Um, you know, normally um, that means the quick, the quicker the reaction, the, the better results. Um, you know, when you're sitting there, um, a lot of fighting games, the part of the challenge of fighting games is to sit there and it's in it's kind of a reaction time and so, and so such like that. So when you look at challenges, um, there's a lot of um, some, some some categories here that relate to game goals. So um, one of the first thing with challenges 
um, one of the first game goals um, that's associated with challenges is, is advancement. Basically, your your the goal of your challenge is to um, advance or to reach a higher level. Um, sometimes the game goal is a race, and it's simply um, you're racing against something or racing against time to accomplish something and you know finish it before someone else does or finish it before time run, runs out. Um, your challenge and goal, um, sometimes it's analysis where you're applying, you know, your mental processes to solving riddles and, and codes within, within a certain amount of time. Um, sometimes the challenge is explore, you know, exploration to, you know, move in, move into new areas, see new things within, within stuff. Sometimes your challenge could involve conflict, um, you know, disagreement or, con or ultimately, combat between characters and it's you know it's something that's used to provide tent can be provide used to provide tension within your games sometimes the challenge is um capture to you know capture take or destroy something um, or you can have the chase challenge where you're 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 not trying not necessarily um trying to capture but you're trying to cat chase and catch um or elude your opponent. Sometimes the challenge within the game just in, simply involves organizing things or being, or you know, having organization. Um, this is kind of like in your your spatial and your pattern matching um, stuff. You know, games like Tetris, Tetris and things like that. They um, they involve having some sort of organization. Um, escape is kind of where you're rescuing items or players and taking them to safely. You know, go through and collect this, collect as many, you know, save as many people before before time runs out. Sometimes you have simulation type games that it's um the game all involves, you know, it involves construction where you're, you know, building, maintaining objects and, and continue to construct them. Sometimes the challenge is just finding a solution to to a problem and solving it. Um, and then lastly, um, sometimes the concept is just to outwit the person to where you imply your intrinsic or extrinsic knowledge um, and, you know, to defeat the, to defeat the, defeat the other person. So moving on now, um, we're going to move on to the concept of balance. And basically balance kind of um, involves where basically balance is kind of looking at a game to sit there and, it's looking a lot of it is from the player's perspective perspective and balance involves having players perceive that a game is consistent, fair, and fun. Um, so when you're sitting there and you have a game that's balanced, um, as a player gets, as a player gets more skilled at playing a game, it, it should be a little bit there. There, the ease of winning the game becomes easier. Um, you know, you can still have random events within the game. Um, that can even decrease skilled players chance chances but you should have a balance you know it, it's all about how how um balanced that is so the first um balance is kind of talking about the static balance and static balance is kind of achieved through um basically a lot of it is achieved through the rules of the games and how they interact with each other so um Typically, static balance exi exists before the game starts. And like I said, a lot of it has to do with the rules, um, how the rules create balance within the game. So that way, it may, you know, making it a little bit fair. The next concept in balance is um, within it, within a gameplay is um, symmetry, which where you sit there and um, you look, and as you start the game, you give each player or non-player character, um, you start them off with, um, with, with the same, you know, starting conditions or abilities. So when you sit there and you look, um, like one of the classic games I love playing on my computer that I still have the original version of is, um, age of empires where you're sitting there and your goal is to build your empire and build your empire bigger, um, and better and possibly overtake the, um, overtake the, other empires within your game and 
all of your empires are started with, you know, all your empires start with the same resources. And your goal is to build up, build up and um, build up and create more resources than what your opponents have. Um, so that way, when you do decide that you're going to attack them, you'll be able to overcome them. Um, but in that game, you all start, you all start with the same, same um, available resources. It's how you use them um, to increase your skill level, you know, that's going to vary. So uh, in the concept of um, symmetry, we have different types of relationships as well. We have the transitive relationship, um, which is a, it's a kind of a one-way relationship between two or more resources um, where if you sit there and you look, um, if you have three characters, um, A can be more powerful than B, which is more powerful than C. So therefore, um, when you sit there and you think in, think in um, you know, in math terms, transitive property, if A is bigger than, is more powerful than B and B is more powerful than C, then it's trend, then you can recumulate it to, the situation that A is more than more powerful than C as well. Um, whereas when you sit there and you look at the concept within balance, um, you can also have um, an intransitive relationship between them, where if A is more powerful than B, um, B may be more powerful than C, but C could also be more powerful than A. Um, it's kind of your rock, paper, scissors, you know, rock, rock, rock beat scissors. Um, scissors beat paper and then paper can beat rock you know that type of that type of things so when we're looking at balance and we're talking about in static balance um sometimes we have the um the concept of trade-offs so where you sit there and you look um trade-offs may be um when you're sitting there and you're looking at buying resources and you may sit there and you look, okay, I have the option between A and B, A may cost more resources. Um, you know, um, for example, in one of the examples it uses in trade-offs, it uses an example in the Sims. Um, in the Sims, you can buy, you know, the more expensive, um, better looking furniture, but it's not comfortable. So you, you trade, you make the trade off of good looking for sake of comfort, where I suppose you may buy the cheaper furniture that doesn't look as good, but it's very, very comfortable. And that's the concept of in static, a static balance concept of trade off. Sometimes you may, you know, sometimes you can buy the cheaper weapon because it has more availability for am ammunition, but the ammunition doesn't cause as much damage, um, you know, as the expensive weapon may. So the next concept when we're talking within balance is the ability for combination or the ability to, to um, combine, basically combine, um, combine resources to, you know, take the power of both of that, take the back, take the ability of both of those resources and to um, combine it and make it stronger. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of merge games that are out there today that kind of take advantage, take advantage of this, this concept. Um, one of the uh, uh, concepts in balance in the balance as is as the games um, progress. Um, sometimes as games progress, things can fall out of out of balance. And um, one of the things that you can do to restore that balance is through feedback. Um, you know, sometimes it's positive feedback, sometimes it's negative feedback. So um, in other words, as the, um, you know, as you're going through and um, an example of example with this is, okay, if one player, if you're, you have two players playing a game and trying to keep it balanced to where they, where one player doesn't get too far ahead of another, um, sometimes the player that's way ahead could all of a sudden find the game um, more difficult to play until the second player catches up. Um, in a lot of sports games, they they'll have this to where, if you're sitting there and um, you turn that mode on, 
it will, um, you know, if you start winning by a, by a certain, certain amount, it's going to um, start making things happen in the game to decrease your odds of, of built, you know, increasing the, the score difference. So when we're sitting and we're talking, um, those are all concepts of things that are kind of stat things to um, that are based in static balance. Um, the other kind of balance um, is all, all games will begin with static balance, but as they're setting in set in motion by players, um, the concept of dynamic balance um, occurs. And dynamic balance, you know, allows players to truly interact with the games. Players will interact with, um, you know, in main ways they interact with this balance is through um, destruction, maintenance, and re re restoration. So obviously, when you're sitting there and you're looking, if you start with a balanced game, and you go through um, looking at the concept of destruction, if I go through, um, if everything in the game is bound is balanced, but if I don't do things to maintain balance, um, and I go through and the opposing forces are going through to um, trying to destroy the resource, destroy my resources while keeping their resources intact, you know, keep me from destroying their resources, that kind of, it's a dynamic way of taking the balance off. If I destroy more of your resources, you, you know, in the game, you would have less resources available while I'll still have more and we therefore become out of balance. Another way to, um, to a dynamic way of keeping balance is if I'm, we're playing against things, instead of um, the concept of me trying to destroy your, your resources, I maintain my resources and make, and make my resources grow. If I maintain my resources better than you maintain your resources, uh, the balance of the game is going to shift towards me because, because of how I'm working with maintaining. And then, of course, where you're sitting, you're looking, um, because we've talked destruction, we've talked about maintaining. Um, if you happen to destroy resources and I go through and decide to restore them um, and rebuild them, then as I go through and rebuild my resources that you've destroyed, um, I'm working to, you know, affect the, you know, by balance dyna dynamically. So, um, a lot of this chapter kind of goes through and it talked, we talked, you know, started off talking about rules of play, interactive via modes. Um, we talked about game theory, challenges, balances. Um, there weren't slides on it, but the concept of game economies. So basically game economies is it's systems in which resources move around um, either physically or conceptual, conceptually within the game. So resources could be money, troops, characters, weapons, property, skills, basically anything that a player can um can own so there's lots of games out there that you've played where you sit there and you're you're looking kind of at in, within the gameplay about how you manage manage the economy how you can sit there and use the concept of economy to um by trading off with other people to um to have that win-win type situation to where where you may you may gift your opponent, you know, gift, gift um, the person you're playing with resources so that you're both at a spot where you can be able to complete a task, um, different things like that. That's kind of how the um, game economy systems fall in, fall into play. Um, and then the last thing um, the chapter talks about, again, is gameplay and document documentation. So as you're starting to see now, um, these chapters are going to start, um, start, start finishing or the end of each chapter is going to start focusing more on on the concept of documentation within your design of games so as you're learning um so now that you've learned about gameplay elements you'll have you basically in this chapter talks about the fact that you have everything you need to create a concept document um proposal or game design document and as, these are all things that we'll discuss even more in detail in chapter 11 but basically taking the story and gameplay elements together you're able to go through and have a lot of what you need to be able to to build these doc to build this documentation that, that would be required in require required for building your games um which is kind of a lot what a lot of the goals are um in game design or game developments um behind the scene be besides actually sitting down on the computer and writing your code um 
you know, when you sit there and you look, if you're going to decide that you're going to build the game, um, you go through and you kind of have, you have an idea of your platform, you have an idea of your genre, you have an idea of, you know, all that information. Well, then the next thing you have to sit there, um, you can't just sit there and start building the game and go, oh, I'll get, you know, randomly, you have to have, um, you have to have some sort of an idea of, of a story behind it. It could be a very simple story, but you're going to have some sort of idea of the story that the game's going to tell. And then based off that story, you're going to have to have, you're going to have to establish some rules. You're going to have to establish your gameplay. You're going to have to um, establish how it's going to be, how, what kind of interactivity it's going to have. You're going to establish if it's, if it's a multiplayer game, you're going to have to sit there and look at the concepts with game theory, with the game theory, um, how you introduce, what types of challenges into, into, into the game, how you maintain balance within the game. These are all things that as you're going through um, being part of, you know, in part in developing and building a game, those are all concepts that you have to look into that you can't just sit down and say, I'm going to create the greatest game in the world. Um, if you don't have a story and you don't have an idea of how the gameplay is going to go, you're not going to get far in creating your game. So. So at this point, I'm going to close out PowerPoint. Um, at this point, I would ask if there was any questions, but since I'm the only one here, um, that's kind of a moot point. Um, again, I want to review, um, go through, we've, I've got the lesson notes that I went through. If you wanted to review them, you're going to be reading chapter six. There's chapters, the quiz that's based off, completely based off chapter six. Um, and then the discussion post, um, again, we're talking about the concepts of intrinsic or ex extrinsic knowledge. Um, you're going to be discussing, um, an idea of a game that you might have that takes the concept of using knowledge that you gain within the game um, and knowledge that you, you get knowledge from outside the game to be able to um, work and affect the, the strategy and the play of the game um, with each other. Um, one last thing I wanted to bring back is um, obviously, as you're see, seeing um, great, you know, I'm starting to grade, grade your assignments and get your assignments caught up I'm working trying to get all caught up on all the assignments hopefully like all your assignments submitted um through last week will be you know I should have them graded shortly um if you get very simple feedback of you know great job um unless you've done something like just above and beyond where I have to where great job doesn't cut it that just simply means that you've covered all the points that that I don't have anything I want to go off. And typically, like a, like I've said in my email prior, if you get a comment just simply as feedback of great job or excellent excellent analysis or something to that effect, that just means you hit all the points and your score. You typically you will look and you will see you will have an A a, a grade of an A with one hundred percent. If you have anything less than that. I will, I will give feedback as to why you have it. Um, one of the things I'm noticing is I sit there and I'm very purposely vague because I don't want people, I don't want people to think that they're going to have to write three and four page papers for each of these assignments. However, I also, I'm not going to discourage you from submitting something that's may, maybe just one paragraph or a couple sentences. If in your couple of sentences, you can get, provide the detail needed to understand your concept but typically one or two sentences to um provide an answer for what the what what the assignments are is not it kind of shows that you're not putting the full effort into um understanding the concept and that, that we're looking to, looking to talk into if you sit there and you say 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 you know um, if I ask for a concept concept for a game that meets a certain thing, um, saying I think that game X would be a perfect game to, to destroy to, to, to demonstrate this because it does. That's not that's. You'll notice that as you continue to do that, I'll continue to give you feedback saying I would really like a lot more deep, a little bit more detail regarding this, um, you know. A little more detail and thought behind it and you will notice that as we go further along um each time i keep providing that time of type of feedback your grade will continue to continue to m migrate south because i've been giving feedback been giving feedback saying hey um trying to encourage you to give more detail so um i'm just kind of giving that as 
uh, as feedback because there are there are, are multiple people that kind of are getting um, on their paper parts are not producing um, as much detail as I would like to see in it. Um, you know, provide a little bit of little bit of thought and reasoning behind why you made your choice, not just just what your what your choice is. Um, other than that, everything's been 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 great. Um, and then, um, so we have next week's class is the twenty fourth, um, and then we have class on the third. Then you guys have a week off for spring break. So. Um, at some point, probably on the third, I will start discussing um, everything that's going to go into your final project because we'll be at the point where we'll have enough elements for you guys to at least start making an effort if you choose towards it. Um, I'm working again. Um, I just got to finalize the date, but I'm working to have my friend that works um, doing voiceover stuff to come in and kind of talk about the elements involved with that. It's kind of just something that's interesting. Um, to coincide when we start talking about the sound and stuff like that. I'm working to set up to where he'll join us on the zoom call. He'll be able to, he'll be open to be able to answer questions and stuff like that. So um, it's, it'll be a very interesting and kind of just something a little bit different. Um, so with that, um, I hope all you guys had a great week. I will have this posted for you and um, that's it.